1970 Chevy Nova, not SS. There are no super sports anymore. They're all fake. There are no SS's. All the boomers love the Nova. Even when it's owned by youth. How they love to tell their stories. When embellishing the truth. When embellishing the truth. Shout out to the YouTube channel Real Steel Cars for letting us have this for the day. The entire build of this vehicle is outlined on his YouTube page. Every third generation Chevy Nova has SS badges now. Even if it had the 194 in line 6. Oh, it's an SS. Oh, rare, 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 rare. Super sport. And maybe if this 30-year-old real estate agent selling the car is honest enough, he'll list his Nova as a SS Tribute. The SS badge was to the 1960s and 70s what the Type R sticker was to the 90s and early 2000s. Third Gen Nova. A car for a man who has a dumb guy voice. The type of voice that crawls out under a flat brim cap. This Nova was once blue. Then it was red. And now it's orange. Check out this overspray on the doors and wiring loom. Oh yeah, overspray on the door catch. But the underside of the doors are still kind of red. And this car will still go up on Craigslist with an asking price of $40,000 because third gen Novas are more coveted than Spice Melange. He who controls the Novas controls the boomers. This Nova rebuild is about 70% done, although Kevin, the owner, would like to add an overdrive transmission, front sway bar upgrade, and also redo the interior. And fix the reverse lights, because one doesn't work properly. In fact, while Roman was out driving this thing with Kevin, a middle-aged woman pulled up alongside them to first compliment the car, two, ask what engine it was running, and three, to inform him that the left rear taillight was out. And that's not all. The speedometer is off, meaning that Kevin has to use an app on his phone to tell how fast he's going at any one time. Generally, the faster you're going, the more incorrectly the stock speedometer will read. The seats are cushioned only in a nominal sense. There's zero support here. So if you have an achy back, you better have a creamy handful of Ben Gay in that palm. Under the hood is a Chevy 350. Why not an LS? I wondered this myself. See, a Nova body in this okay from 20 feet condition is the perfect candidate for an LS swap. Look, the car has had many owners, many paint jobs, no pedigree at all, and originally it was a straight six car. And it's rusty. Rust is bubbling up, pushing up through the paint. Rust is in the trunk. Rust is under the weather seals. So this is not an $80,000 show car. It's just a daily runner, which means you don't really have to worry about it. But Kevin didn't go with an LS. He went with an SBC 350, the classic small block Chevy. It's carbureted, it's got the staggered headers, distributor in the back, and it's an engine that was originally designed in 1955. Go check out Fuel Injection Sucks page, cause he, uh, Justin over there at that channel, got his hands on an original 1955 Chevy small block. And he goes over how weird they are. But anyway, that's when these engines were originally conceived. Now here's my rant on the three Chevy 350. I still believe these engines are pointless and you shouldn't use them when LSs are so cheap because you are going to spend more making a small block Chevy perform like an LS when an LS, to perform great, needs no real upgrades at all. You don't even have to take the heads off of a stock LS motor to make it perform. Anyway. In order to make this 350 perform, the following changes had to be made. Oh, and by the way, this is, is an entirely rebuilt engine, which you don't have to do with LSs, but anyway. This 350 is now technically a 360 because it's been bored over. It now is a roller motor with a Howard's camshaft, profiler cylinder heads, Edelbrock air gap intake, quick fuel 750 carburetor, long tube headers, electric radiator fan. I don't know the compression, but it's up to about 450 horsepower and 475 pound feet of torque. Now that's similar power to a dirty 280,000 mile LS. All that, and all, uh, all an LS needs to do 
To make 450 horsepower easy is a cam, valve springs, and a $180 Chinese eBay turbocharger, and that's it. So why build up a yesteryear engine and put it in here? Because an LS motor is automotive cilantro. It overpowers everything else about the car to where the entire identity of that car is now an LS swap. Using a small block Chevy allows a car to be unified in its presentation to you. Oh, look, a DeLorean. Oh, now it's an LS DeLorean. Oh, look, a Winnebago. Oh, LS Winnebago. Oh, look, free pizza. Oh, cilantro pizza. Get it? Once you LS something, other car people dismiss paint, scratches, switches, upholstery, suspension. If I open this hood and you saw the Telltale LS in there with a the curvy intake and everything, the big alternator sitting up high, you would no longer care about the Bilstein shocks, Hotchkiss springs, subframe connectors, Beltec sway bars, new subframe bushings. Nope. You maybe would care about the Flowmaster 40 series mufflers and, well, this has a Turbo 350. Most people don't put Turbo 350s on the end of LSs. They use 4L60s if they're stupid and 4L80s if they're wise. Maybe you'd care about the gearing in the 10 bolt rear, which is 373 or the 2800 stall converter. But this Novo retains a period correct engine, so the car, as it presents itself to you, remains whole. 2800 RPM stall converter, huh? What are you, a drag racer? <laughs> you know what that gets you? Yeah, I mean, it hooks up better, but it also gets you eight miles a gallon. Ugh, these people that they think they, uh, they think they need high stall converters. Stall converters are to automatic transmissions what slipping the clutch is to a manual transmission. The fluid dynamics in your average automatic transmission car with a torque converter become fully unified somewhere around 1,000 RPM, maybe 1,200 RPM, but never up to 2,000 RPM. 2,800 RPM on an engine that maybe revs to five means when you, by the time you're merged onto the highway doing 50 miles an hour, that torque converter has finally stopped slipping. So half the time when you're driving this around, certainly around in town, all of that power is not getting to the wheels, it's just spinning around inside the transmission. And it's not even in the transmission, it's still in the fucking bell housing. Ugh. The whole point of high stall converters is for drag racing applications. So you can rev the engine up, you can, you know, put your foot on the brake and the foot on the gas, get those RPMs up, but the power is not yet fully going to the wheels. You try to do that in my Falcon, you spin the rear wheels, but this, you can load a bit more and launch better. But for just driving around town, having that stall converter, this, okay, there's another reason to have high stall converters. So you can just rev at people in an automatic transmission, like you have a manual. You can just drive down on a highway and again with a high stall converter, you can just go vroom, 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 and all you're doing is just spinning the stall converter. It's not yet getting to the wheels yet. It's super <laughs> lag. I guess it smooths it out a minute. I've ran it enough. But this car still has power drum brakes. If that wasn't a giveaway that it wasn't an SS from the start. It drives like a Chevy S10 Blazer. <laughs> or maybe a, an express van. It just kind of eh, left. And, eh. But with over 400 pound feet, and if you let that torque converter finally spin up to the RPM as you merge onto the highway, whoop, the back end comes around really quick. Ooh, that's the <laughs> So all you really do with a Nova like this is you drive straight, put your arm out the window, and smile for admirers. They're all going to be wearing Blue Line Oakleys, but it's good to network. Treat it like a ride at the county fair. All steel and nostalgia and motor oil and uncertainty. Mileage? No idea. The odometer reads 54,000 and change, but that could have rolled over many times. There's about 750 miles on the new motor. Yep. So when we were driving this, it was still breaking in. 1970 Chevy Nova. 
For the boomer who wants to be the friend you brag about to other friends about knowing. Sponsored by the man who makes loud declarations about the weather to no one in particular. Oh boy, it sure is a scorcher today. Chevy Nova, a magnet for old men who blow their nose loudly in nice restaurants. But make no mistake, third gen Novas exude cool. It's loud and colorful, like a coked-out tag team from the 1980s. Sure, by Kevin's own admission, it's a money pit. And car snobs might call it a sentient mustache from the period where 22-year-olds look 36. But this is a car that could make a guy eating a corn dog look cool. It's finally getting to be that cool kid you always knew you were, deep down inside. Maybe your mom didn't buy you the sugary name-brand cereals when you were a kid, and you got made fun of for your puffed wheat, but... But where are all those cool Cocoa Crispy kids now? Doing hard time. Yeah, you can get your kids' name-brand cereals, but damn it, Malto Meal teaches values. And it's cool because this body shape can never be replicated anymore. Safety standards don't allow it. Oh sure, modern manufacturers like to bend the plastic and try to make modern muscle cars like the Demon and the Hellcat and the, the Mustang evoke the image of the old style cars, but they can't ever get the lines quite right. Things have to be aerodynamic, they have to be safe, they have to be pedestrian friendly. So the true shape always carries this premium. In a sense, this Nova is the ideal car for Xennials, that orphan group between Generation X and Millennials. People like me, who identify with either generation, but claim neither. You were born during the Carter administration, or maybe the first year of the Reagan administration. And, no matter who boomers are complaining about this week, you feel the weight of their accusations. It's a group young enough to vividly remember the birth of social media, but too old to ever look cool using it. Social anxiety rises as you search for welcome, seeking bright eyes and open arms. You feel a longing in the depth of your soul, but you're also militantly opposed to ever getting married or having children. So here you go, a Chevy Nova, a beautiful piece of simulacrum representing the mass appeal of rarity. This is a car that will be welcome anywhere it goes. You will be welcome anywhere you go. You won't just have younger generations thinking you're cool when you drive this. Boomers will have to nut up and admit that maybe there's hope for the youth of America yet. Youth, in this case, meaning the people on the broad side of 40. You'll have the boomers' respect, but it's begrudging as they compromise their polygrip in the jealous gnashing of teeth. You see, boomers may rag on younger generations for being self-involved, but they were no less self-obsessed in their day. Every young generation wants to change the world, and they all eventually settle into the nine-to-fives and forget what it was ever like to be that young, and rationalize the difference by saying that so-and-so generation is different. It's just the time. In a Principal Skinner kind of way, it's the children who are wrong. But that's not it. Boomers want a pat on the back for changing the world, for doing the work that time would have done anyway. And that's what every generation expects when they get old. So let's stop pretending that we're all that different from one pair of decades to the next. Because the unending shape of the third generation Nova is the navigator that folds space so we all can connect. If heaven were a K car, I'd be less afraid to die. I'd find an open highway and just hit the gas and drive. But till that day arrives, the Nova is my guide A northern star for northern hearts to hide Until I get to you Throttle body, please respond Until I get to you I'll catch you on the road